Sheila must have had espresso with her breakfast this morning. <laughs> that was wonderful, thank you. Since Jesus came into my heart. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. Are you glad to be out of that deep freeze we had there for a while? Ooh, that was winter. We're, it's good to see each one. It's good to be together. And our flower arrangement this morning is from Marty Larson in celebration of being a member of the church again. So thank you, Marty. A bell choir will practice tomorrow night at 6.30 and the regular choir on Wednesday at 6.30. And this week our Bible study will pick back up on Thursday at 10 o'clock. We'll start a new series, so everyone's welcome to attend. We always have good discussion and uh, you'll be most welcome if you'd like to join us 10 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, also, if you'd like to sign up for to host Coffee Hour or um, the sponsor of the weekly flower arrangement, there are sign-up sheets in the back for that, too. Are there any other announcements? Okay, no hands. Uh, let's stand and join in singing in our opening hymn, Gather Us In. It's number 284. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Happy are those who fear the Lord, who greatly delight in his commandments. Wealth and riches are in their houses, their righteousness endures forever. It is well with those who deal generously and lend, who conduct their affairs with justice. Let us pray. Almighty God, in the glorious incarnation of your Son, Jesus Christ, you have sent a new light into the world. Give us grace that we may so receive the same light into our hearts and to be guided by it into the way of everlasting salvation. Help us, Lord, to lift our eyes to you, to hear you speak, 
and to listen with open hearts to your gospel. Empower us to respond to your word with obedience and help us to be your shining lights in the world. And we pray in Jesus' name, the light of the world. Amen. sweet oh by and by there's a better day a coming in the sky lord in the sky will the circle, circle be unbroken in the sweet, in the sweet oh by and by there's a better day a coming in the sky, Lord, in the sky. Will the circle be broken in this week? Oh, by and by, there's a better day a coming. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, 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 let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, no. I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, 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 let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out, I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Don't let Satan blow it out. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, shine, shine. Let it shine. Okay. You, the fifth chapter. And we'll be reading verses 13 through 20. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything, but is thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, Whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is God's word for all of us. Now we're still in the season of epiphany with the words of Isaiah ringing in our ears. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The light of the promised Messiah, of Jesus, was born and grew up and set about his teaching ministry, surrounded by his closest disciples. And this reading gives us three word pictures that provide helpful hints about our responsibilities as followers of Christ. The word pictures are salt, and light and city on a hill. 
And we'll explore those metaphors, those helpful images this morning. So here we are in Matthew's Gospel again, joining the action as Jesus said about one of his longest teaching sessions found anywhere in the Gospels. The famous Beatitudes had just been delivered in the previous verses. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek and so forth. And each of the primary eight Beatitudes are followed by a promise. The meek will inherit the earth. The merciful will be shown mercy. The pure in heart will see God. And then a ninth beatitude and its promise may have caused the disciples to kind of uh, furl their brows and lose their enthusiasm. It says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets before you, Now the disciples may have thought, now hold on a minute, what have we gotten ourselves into? This doesn't sound like a very good plan. Those fishermen and tax collectors turned students may have experienced some buyer's remorse at that point. They may have wondered why they had dropped everything that was familiar to them and followed Jesus. They may have begun to consider wandering off as a way of avoiding the insults and the persecution and the false accusations that Jesus was telling them about and predicting for them. And who could blame them? And another temptation they may have had was to continue holding their newfound beliefs, but to withdraw from a society that didn't like them and that didn't like their rock-the-boat message. And that did start to happen not so many years after the time of Christ. There was a group of famous hermits over the centuries who decided the civilization of their day, and even the church, had become too corrupt. They withdrew to the wilderness and became what are now called the Desert Fathers. They were the type of people who said, I'm discouraged at all the hubbub and the corruption and the darkness, so I think I'm just going to withdraw to the countryside where it's quiet and I can think. And that still happens to some extent today. There are people who choose to withdraw from societies that aren't receptive to the ways of the kingdom of God. And this may well have been a temptation that Jesus was heading off at the pass in the case of these disciples. He probably saw their faces after they heard the initially off-putting nature of the Beatitudes and decided to give them some word pictures, some familiar images to let them know why it was important for them to stay focused on their mission. Jesus taught them to stick with it, to engage with the cultures and the religious communities that they would come across. He taught them and us to be salt and light in the world, to stay engaged, to influence our neighbors and our society, to live in such a way that people notice. And the point is that wisdom, the salt that we get from God's word and the grace of God, the light of Christ that we receive, can be reflected out to the world around us. The word can be preserved and spread around. And preservation was one of the uses of salt in the days before refrigeration. And the word can be illuminated so that it can do its work in our lives and in other people's lives, in the lives of those people who are around us. Even if people don't say anything, they may very well notice that you, that we, are different. Kindness and caring and compassion are not that common in the dog-eat-dog world of the 21st century. Matthew heard Jesus saying that Christians can make a difference by being Christian, by reflecting the grace and light that they've received from God out into the world. So these are uh, challenging goals that have been set for us. And even as we read these words and acknowledge that we're called to live into these images, we have to wonder how we can rise to the challenge. How can we embody such practices? How can we truly be the salt and the light that the world needs? So many questions. How can we embody the gospel in ways that will be visible and grace-filled so that a weary world will take notice and ask questions of their own? Now we have our demanding marching orders but they come with the promise of grace and provision for the work that we have been assigned. 
There are two sections in our reading today. Verses 13 to 16 outline both promises and expectations. You, all Christians, as individuals and as the church, are the salt and the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And our job is to let it, our light shine. <clears throat> and then in verses 17 to 20, we find some general principles as lead in to the rest of Jesus' ethical teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said that he came not to abolish the Old Testament law, but to fulfill it. He didn't replace the law, but he took it to a new level. The teachings in the Sermon on the Mount show us that things didn't get easier for God's people, they got harder. Jesus showed how we won't be able to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees because they were good at following the letter of the law. The point is that we can't try hard enough or be good enough on our own. But there's good news here as well. This is where our walk with Christ comes into play. We have mercy and forgiveness, grace and divine love. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit to help us and to strengthen us for the work that God has called us to. We have everything we need already. And the reference to being salt can have multiple meanings. So Jesus was using poetic language that the average person back then would have understood. Besides the preservation of food, salt was also well known as a flavor enhancer for food. Salt also showed up as a symbol of wisdom and a symbol of purity in the Old Testament. And salt was so valuable at that time in some parts of the Roman Empire that they actually uh, paid soldiers their salary uh, in salt. And our word salary comes from the Latin word for salt. And the business world even has an old expression where they say that someone is or isn't worth their salt, worth their pay. And it all sounds really hard, but fortunately, we don't each have to pull off being salt and light all on our own. Being the salt of the earth is most often a community thing. When Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, it meant something like, all y'all. While it did mean the disciples, it also meant those who had gathered to hear Jesus' teaching. So really there are three circles of listeners for Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. The inner circle were the disciples, that set of 12 who had been selected as apostles. And then there was a second tier of listeners, that was the crowd who'd come to hear Jesus and maybe to receive healing. And the third and largest circle of listeners includes us. That outermost circle consists of all the Christians who've been studying these teachings courtesy of Matthew's gospel for more than 2,000 years. Now returning to our second image, the light of the world, we find that it's another community thing. Christian communities have often been beacons of hope in troubled times. Just like a lighthouse is a beacon for ships that may be in trouble or that need a reference point in darkness or fog or stormy weather. And as with the image of being the salt of the earth, the light we're called to shine doesn't have to be generated you know, with great effort on our part. We don't have to manufacture the light out of sheer willpower. We're encouraged to seek and then to reflect the light of Christ. And one way I've heard this described is to keep our windows clean, our souls clean, so that the light of Christ can shine through us. Now Jesus was telling the disciples to be what they already were. He was saying that they already were the salt of the earth and the light of the world and a city on a hill. These weren't aspirations to work toward with superhuman willpower and determination. These were realities to live into because the light wasn't theirs per se. The light of Christ was already theirs and they were being directed to let that light overflow into the lives of the people that they would come in contact with. Jesus taught the disciples and the crowds that day that religion can't be only personal and private. It has to be set on a stand, to be practiced on the hill where others can see and draw hope for their own lives from what they see in followers of Christ. 
God had called Israel to be a light to the nations. And Jesus told the disciples that they were called to be a light to the Gentiles, to the rest of the world, beyond the borders of Israel. So this was an extension of the covenant that would carry God's grace and blessing and kingdom to the whole world. So if you imagine a solar panel, it collects light and converts that energy into electricity. And the light of the gospel can be received and can result in the generation of a different kind of power. The light of the gospel is needed in a world of darkness. And we can capture light and then carry it out to a lost and a broken world. And that light-bearing responsibility has been the church's job since the day of Pentecost. And our faithfulness serves as a witness to others. The illumination we have been given can result in the overflow of light into the darkness. And that can benefit other people. So just as being salt and light are community activities, so is the work of being a city on a hill. Praying, loving, showing mercy, modeling true joy, living generously, caring, engaging in regular scripture study and reading the scripture. Um, there's a guy named William Temple who once wrote, the church is the only organization on earth that exists for those who are not its members. So the whole point of being salt and light and a city on a hill is found in the second part of verse 16. So that they, other people, may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. That's the goal. We have the assurance that our righteousness ultimately is grounded in our relationship with God, whose we are. Not in how well we do this work of being salt and light. Our work is to live in such a way that others are drawn to God and give glory to God. Jesus said that he had come not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And Jesus may have been reacting against charges from the Pharisees that he was teaching things contrary to the Old Testament law. But he taught the disciples that he was both honoring and fulfilling the law. He obeyed the law. He had reverence for the law. But he was renewing and in some cases reapplying the law. He described how the spirit of the law could be even harder to keep than the letter of the law that the scribes and the Pharisees had been disciplined to keep. Some of Jesus' early followers made claims about the law being obsolete. But Matthew shows us here that Jesus didn't come to get rid of the law, but to bring it to fruition. And looking again at verses 17 and 18, we find, Think not that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So the Old Testament and the New Testament both bear witness to the Savior and both work together to give God's story of salvation. We, the church, are in a position to be salt and light to the world. The people in darkness need a great light. That's a metaphor that's been part of the church's essential work from the very beginning. These metaphors, these symbols, these descriptions of a godly life call for a great amount of trust on our part. When we meet together as light reflectors, as a city on a hill, things are happening. We don't see all the ramifications. All that you've seen and learned in, over the years that you've been in church has helped to form you. And conversely, all the ways that you've gone out and lived as a disciple have helped to form the church just a little bit more. It's a dynamic process, and the process starts with God's word flowing out to the community. Against all odds, God's word endures. It has endured for thousands of years, and it will continue to endure. And we do our part by being the salt and light that Jesus says we have been ever since we became believers. We don't start out as followers and then mature into being salt and light and a city on a hill. We are already those things by the grace of God. 
and we live into those roles as best we can throughout our lives. We serve God by being part of a city on a hill, by being a light in the darkness. By being a lighthouse, we help people get their bearings and find their way safely through the complexity and the disappointments that life can bring. And it isn't our light, it's God's light that shines through us, overflowing to other people, shining on their path so that they can find their way. So by being the church together, we can serve as an outpost in the darkness. By the grace of God and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are bearers of the light of Christ together. To God be the glory. Amen. Our prayer hymn today is number 322, O Word of God Incarnate. Lift your hearts up to the Lord. Let us pray. Mighty God, we give you praise as we are gathered here for worship and for prayer. You are the one whose word we trust and whose spirit enables us to pray. We pause now to remember those who helped us come to faith by singing us songs or telling us stories, by inviting us in when we felt distant, by praying for us without being asked. We remember with gratitude all those who have helped us grow into our faith. And we ask you to accept our requests today and bring peace and comfort to those who are sick. We pray for all those who are on our prayer list and also for their families. We believe that you are the great physician and we trust and pray that your healing touch will be felt by those who are suffering and by those who are worried or weary. Eternal God, you sent us a Savior, Jesus Christ, to break down the walls of hostility that divide us. Send us peace on earth and put down greed and pride and anger which turn nation against nation and race against race. May wars end and all your children be reconciled to one another. May the peace of Christ descend upon us and remain with us as we answer your call to be salt and light. Help us as we join together now, in Jesus' name, the one who taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The act of giving is an act of faith. Not only does it signify your belief that what you give makes a difference in this world, it also shows that you understand all you have to be from God. I invite you, my sisters and brothers, to give now as an act of faith. Our deacons now will collect our offerings. <laughs> These gifts were first yours, God, reflections of your loving presence among us. Please guide the ways these gifts are used now, that they would further your love for all creation. May they lead us to forgive and reconcile, speak and seek truth. May they honor your love. Amen. Differences fade. Here we receive the gifts of courage and humility to name the thing we have in common with every other human being, our need for God and our need for one another. At this table, we commune. Come now, all of you, commune with God, commune with each other. Come now to this table, for these are God's gifts for God's people. Please join in singing our communion hymn, number 408, Come Share the Lord.
received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Almighty and gracious God, our worship service centers on this meal of remembrance at your table. Help us prepare our hearts for receiving the bread and cup in praise and gratitude for Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. May the bread and cup remind us of our call to follow Christ's example of sacrificial love. May this time of sharing together bless and fill us. May it deepen our faith and give us strength to carry on. We're thankful for the mercy and the grace that you continually extend to us. Hold us close, now and forevermore. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. That's good. As we leave our worship service, may we see our lives and God's light shining in us, in our lives as the gifts that they are. May the light of the gospel of Christ shine in our hearts, transform our lives, and brighten up the whole world. Hear now our benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So go now in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>